Kitco Mining special coverage of the Mining Investment Event of the North is brought to you by EMX Royalty Corp. Our next guest told us early in 2003 that juniors would have a very hard time, even with sky-high metals prices, and that's exactly what we've seen. Rick Rule, founder of Rule Investment Media and a longtime contributor to Kitco Mining. Welcome. Pleasure to be back with you. So let's get started with uh, macro. The Fed had its pause last week. The markets were largely priced in for the pause, but they did say that we could be seeing rate hikes as early as July. They predicted maybe two more this year or two more before the, before the, the stop of the tightening cycle and as early as July. So when you speak to businesses these days, what are you telling them? Uh, have we averted a recession or what's the situation? I'm going to have to answer the question elliptically by saying I'm pleased and astonished by the strength of the economy in the face of the interest rate rises that we've seen. I had anticipated two years ago that the economy was far more credit dependent than it's proven to be. My hope is that the depth in particular of the U.S. economy uh, will continue to be strong. Uh, I remain a skeptic. At the same time that I say that, I'm distressed as a saver that real interest rates are negative. If you look at the interest rate that they would pay you as an example to own the U.S. 10-year Treasury, it's still below the CPI stated rate of inflation, which means that as a saver, your money, or at least your purchasing power, disappears. So what I'm telling companies is that they have to uh, provide for a higher cost of capital, higher cost of equity and capital, higher cost of debt capital. Even if the nominal interest rate stays the same or falls, what you're seeing is a crowding out of private borrowers by public borrowers, by governments, and you're seeing higher real costs of debt capital uh, in industry. The same time that you're seeing moderated share prices, with, with the exception of, of big tech, perhaps, uh, raising equity prices. So we're telling the companies that we talk to that they have to be prepared for a higher cost of equity capital and debt capital. On the investors, what I'm telling them is I'm no economist. I am a credit analyst. And I think that investors need to understand that at least nominal yields rise, which means that bond prices continue to fall. Also, in my life, I've never gone as long as we've gone without a real recession. And a one wonderful trigger of a recession is higher interest rates. So I would have expected a recession by now. And I need to caution Kit no, Kitco listeners. I'm always nervous. I, I joke that I've correctly called 17 of the last three declines. So the fact that I'm nervous is certainly nothing new. I've been talking to Kitco audiences for 20 years, and I've been nervous for 20 years. All right. Well, then, uh, I guess on the one hand, we take it with a grain of salt. But on the other hand, that's the, that's the, the wise move is to... Uh, certainly, if you prepare... In this environment. If you prepare yourself for the worst, that you'll do pretty well at middling market. That's what I'm asking people to do. All right. Now, let's uh, looking at gold in particular... So we did see a run up for gold and it's now it's now kind of in a bit of a holding pattern. On the one hand, we have uh, we have uh, U.S. dollar weaknesses supporting the gold price, but we also have uh, apparent U.S. U.S. economy strength that's uh, potentially holding it back a little bit. Uh, why why haven't we seen a bigger push, a bigger and a broader push into gold yet? Does, does gold have a marketing problem? Are there just not enough people who are invested in gold's success? I think that's one problem. I think a bigger problem is that investor perception at all levels uh, was formed in 40 very benign years. The period 1982 to 2022, you were probably 40 of the most benign years in economic history. Low interest rates, globalization, inclusion in the workforce. My belief is that ended in 2022. But my belief is that investor perceptions and investor actions were formed in 40 benign years. Gold does well when people are afraid, particularly when they're afraid of the decline of their purchasing power in real terms. They have gone through 40 very, very, very kind years. And I don't believe that people are as afraid as they should be. When I broke into the investment, investing business in the early part of the decade of the 70s, we'd been through 20 benign years. At the beginning of the decade of the 70s, most people couldn't spell gold. By the end of the decade of the 70s, believe me, 
everybody could spell gold. So my suspicion is that gold will come to be very well known in the next 10 years, which is, given the rest of the economy, unfortunate. Right. So, so you, I guess this is a way of saying that you don't believe that uh, inflation is under control or will be. And, and, and you, see, you see purchasing power declining over the long term. Absolutely positive. Several things. Let's do them in order. Quantitative easing. If you and I did it, it would be called counterfeiting. It's producing more specious currency units. I don't know about you, but when I was brought up, producing more of something at zero cost with zero utility was inflationary. It doesn't make the existing stock more valuable. Worse, debt and deficits. I can't speak to Canon, your country. But in my country, we have $32 trillion in on-balance sheet liabilities and $100 trillion net present value of off-balance sheet liabilities. It's $130 trillion at the federal level. We service that debt with a deficit, with a budget that's in deficit to $2 trillion a year. I mean, that makes you even nervous about the debtor, the U.S. government. But it gets worse. Negative real interest rates. Uh... Nothing could be more concerning about the strength of U.S. dollar-denominated savings products than the government's explicit guarantee that if you loan them money for 10 years, you will end up poorer than when you started. That's the first government guarantee in my life that I have faith that they're going to follow through. The fourth is simple market share. Uh, precious metals and precious metals-related assets. Kitco will love the statistic, by the way. Uh, the market share of precious metals and precious metals-related assets is one-half of 1% in the U.S., which is to say one-half of 1% of savings and investment products in the United States are in precious metals-oriented assets. The four-decade mean is 2%. If acceptance of precious metals and precious metals-related assets merely reverts to mean, demand increases fourfold. And that's precisely what I think is going to happen. So you, you mentioned that uh, that by the end of the 70s, everyone knew how to spell gold. Everyone everyone became very well acquainted with the value of gold in that type of an environment. What was it like before that? Uh, is this mean? Is this what, what do you think is the most uh, realistic scenario for gold? Are we really going to get back to that level, a 2% level? What do you think? Because it's a very different world, a very different economy. What do you think is the realistic expectation uh, for 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 the share. I didn't want to throw kerosene in my fire. Uh, the statistics didn't exist in 1980 or 1981, but J.P. Morgan Chase estimates that in 1981, at the top of the cycle for precious metals and precious metals-related assets, that over 5% of the savings and investment assets in the United States were denominated in gold. I didn't talk about a reversion to peak. I talked about a reversion to mean. The mean, four-decade mean, 1982 to 2022, was 2%. And that's what I think is going to happen. Okay, so 2% is realistic if 5% is, is a realistic peak. And within five years. Many of your listeners, of course, uh, have trauma holding stock a metal of the long weekend. But people need to understand that these themes, these big, broad themes, take time to play out. If we experience, which I believe we will, a reversion to mean uh, and... The market share of precious metals and precious metals related securities goes to 2% of the total asset class. That's a fourfold increase in demand for these assets. Uh, if we get that, and I think we will within five years, the people with emoticon patience will be very well wolf. When five years isn't an eternity. Just now, we also saw uh, Bitcoin stealing some of uh, gold's thunder uh, during the run up earlier in the decade. Uh, what is the impact of critical metals right now for gold? It, are, is critical metals cannibalizing some of the investor interest that gold would otherwise be enjoying? Perhaps among the Sprott audience and the Kitco audience, but the truth is that each of critical metals, gold and crypto, relative to the universe of savings and investment assets in the world, are pimples on an elephant's behind. They're irrelevant. They may compete with each other for the attention of the speculative fringe, but they're all separate assets. They all perform separate roles and portfolios. And in the grand scheme of things, it's estimated that savings and investment assets worldwide uh, come to about $750 trillion. 
the market capitalization uh, of crypto now is below $1 trillion. Uh, so to argue that in the grand scheme of things, crypto competes with gold uh, denies arithmetic. It, it exists as a factor in the narrative that the speculative community cares about. But in a grand sense, they're very different things. Crypto is, at least it's supposed to be, an anonymous medium of exchange. That's its utility. As its popularity grows, its utility increases because it's a more efficient uh, medium of exchange. Gold is unique in that it's potentially an anonymous medium of exchange, but it's really a store of wealth. Uh, those are very, very, very different functions. Uh, critical metals are really a speculation on the ascent of humankind uh, and technology. So I view them as three separate asset classes. They certainly occupy three different parts of my own portfolio. Okay, and, and what what do you see kind of running with the idea of a 2%? Now, we obviously don't have this massive range of historical data to draw on, but what do you think is a realistic expectation for, let's just talk about Bitcoin itself. Uh, what do you think is a realistic uh, market share for Bitcoin in this environment? So we're assuming that that uh, real interest rates are, are too low. We're assuming that inflation is very high and for a prolonged period of time. What what role will Bitcoin have to play? And if, if gold is going to revert to its mean of 2%, what is the ceiling or even maybe the mean for Bitcoin in that type of an environment? I hate to take a question, but I grew up in resources in gold. Um, and I don't feel that I have a competitive knowledge advantage in Bitcoin. So I actually have to say, I don't know. All right, fair enough. Uh, now, you were also, uh, you were right about gold prices as well. So you were, you were predicting the juniors were going to have a hard time. They have. Uh, you also said gold would be held down by risk aversion, even though it would have a nice run up due to inflation worries. Uh, what do you see on the horizon for gold prices in the near term? Obviously, we have the big picture, but what do you see, say, by the end of 2023 for gold? In the very near term, there's a lot of confidence, right? Uh, and I think that's a difficult environment for gold. With nominal interest rates rising, the attraction of standard deposit products, bank deposit products, short-term government bonds is high. Uh, there is less concern about the depreciation of the currency than I believe should be the case. But my belief is that gold is going to have a, a challenging period, flat to down, through 2023. Doesn't mean I'm right. Uh, I continue to buy gold personally because I regard it as an insurance policy and I would rather buy insurance when it's cheap than dear. But in answer to your question, I think that gold's going to be challenged in the near term because of relative strength in the bond market uh, and the belief on the part of very large investors that the Fed has a reasonable chance of engineering a soft landing. A belief, by the way, that I don't share, but I don't make a market. So when Agnico Eagle did its deals for Yamana and Detour, uh, it really talked up two things, safe jurisdiction and clean power. Uh, how highly do you value partners situated in Quebec uh, that benefit from the geopolitical stability of this area? I am much more oriented myself to deposit quality and political risk. Uh, I have the belief, with all due respect to Quebec, where we're sitting right now, that every political jurisdiction on the planet is lousy. Every single one. My biggest experience personally, worst experience personally with political risk, was in my home jurisdiction then, the People's Republic of California. I don't believe that there is a good jurisdiction. I believe that Agnico Eagle has a unique capability in Northern Canada because they've been there for 40 years. They have experience with it. But personally, the best jurisdiction in my life was Chile. Uh, they have unfortunately decided to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory by changing politically. I guess my point is that there is no good thing as a safe political jurisdiction. There are jurisdictions where different management teams have demonstrated competence. And Ignigo Eco uh, has demonstrated competence, first in northern Canada, but specifically in Quebec. So for them, it's probably the best jurisdiction on the planet. So I guess it's uh, you can have very stable jurisdictions that can overtax or over uh, hamper, uh, to overregulate. And then you can have 
uh, less developed and less stable jurisdictions where the weakness becomes the weakness of the of the government itself becomes the threat. But in both cases, it's it's bad for it's bad for mining investment. For me, what I've learned is that my biggest risk is deposit is. I don't worry too much about a government stealing something that isn't worth stealing. So my first risk is that what I discover is not economic and not worth stealing. I'll worry about political risk, which I do, after I worry about technical. If you want to look at the best jurisdiction in the world for me, money in, money out, not the one I made the most money in, but the best jurisdiction in the world for me, money in, money out, return on capital employed, was Congo. One of the worst jurisdictions in the world, politically. But the fact that I had no competition there and I was able to participate in very, very, very high quality resources with top quality people at a price that reflected people's uh, interpretation of the political risk uh, simply means that for me, it, it was the best jurisdiction uh, I, I could have participated in. Now, much more recently, I've been a very successful investor for 20 years in Russia. Uh, that came to a screeching halt. You know, there, there, there is danger uh, in playing the political risk game too hard. Right. But, uh, but uh, as you said, it's, it's really led by the quality of the resources, the quality of the deposits. And, and the quality of the people in front. You know, absolutely. I mean, one of the beauties of Quebec is that there's a long-established mining business here. And there are some extremely high-quality people. Uh, I'm doing business now with a Quebec family, the Gignac family. Uh, I'm doing business with them in South America. But one of the greatest successes of my career uh, was co-launched by Pierre Lasson. Uh, more recently, André Gaumont. Uh, the beauty of Quebec for me is simply that there's a community here that I know and trust and love, and I've done business with them for 30 years. So the risk for me being associated with those people, those people, not this place, those people, is nil, and they're here. All right. Well, that's encouraging. Now, now, what about uh, clean power and ticking uh, the other ESG boxes? What, what, uh, what, uh, to what degree do you value that? The world needs all kinds of power. I've been invested myself from time to time in all forms of alternative energy. I've, you know, built solar, wind, financed low head hydro and geothermal. But your audience needs to understand that the world has invested almost five trillion dollars in alternative energy in 40 years. Five trillion. Let that sink in. We've reduced the market share of fossil fuels in that period of time from 82 percent all the way down to 81. It's cost us five trillion dollars to reduce the market share of fossil fuels by one percent. A billion people on Earth have no access to electricity. They want it. Two billion people on Earth have access to intermittent or unaffordable uh, uh, electricity. I want more wet. I want more solar. They want more coal. They need more nuclear. There is a future for all kinds of energy. If you get too caught up in the so-called clean energy narrative, by the way, no energy is clean, uh, you miss a world of opportunity and you don't make the world a better place you meet the world a worse place. Right, so that 1% reduction is really a massive increase in demand and in consumption, and then uh, developed economies racing along trying to increase solar, increase wind, in an environment where we need more of everything all the time. So it's a real reduction, I guess, if you calculate that, uh, that the, the demand and, and, and the production, the consumption explodes, and so you're kind of maybe reining in a little bit of what could have gone to other places, but you're still not actually producing enough power, is, is essentially what you're saying. I'm not suggesting that living, breathing human beings shouldn't invest in alternative energy. That's not my suggestion. My suggestion is that when people focus myopically on clean energy, they forget the fact that fossil fuels are the most efficient economically form of energy that exists, and to deny their portfolios participation in that is silly and for humankind to ignore the fact that a billion people on earth would like to live like you and i and will over the next 40 years is naive 
All right. Now, coming back to the juniors, um, you, you've said that uh, you don't believe in most juniors and that uh, most of them should just go away. Why, why exactly do you say that? Uh, I believe in efficiency. Uh, and I'll give you uh, two statistics. If you merged every junior in the world, not just the Canadians, but every junior in the world, there's probably, what, 2,500 of them? If you form one company, we'll call it Junior Explore Co. In a very good year, that business, Junior Explore Co., would lose $2 billion. That is expenditures over realizations through M&A or something else. In a very bad year, it would lose $6 billion. So you tell me, how much money would you spend for a business that loses $2 billion a year? Would you invest eight times losses? 12 times losses? What's the right price, price loss ratio? The industry as a whole is a destroyer of capital, not a creator of capital. That belies the point that 5% of the issuers, perhaps, maybe 10, generate such good performance that they add legitimacy and sometimes luster to a whole sector. So what I'm saying is that if you participate in juniors, you have to be extremely selective. 90% of them aren't businesses, their lifestyle exercises, or their dreams. 5% uh, of them are shaped with businesses, but most investors spend too much time on narrative and not enough time on arithmetic. They don't get to know their companies well enough. A different statistic, and this is horrifying, uh, a, a young intern of ours 20 years ago uh, did a statistical sample for me of 25 randomly selected TSX junior resource companies. And among other things, he found out that the median expenditure among 25 companies was that over 60% of the capital raised went to general and administrative expense and less than 40% went in the ground. For juniors, where you would expect that it would be, it would be very much the other way around. Like how how, how top heavy ought they be? Well, one of the things is, of course, between listing expense, legal and audit, all those things that a, a junior must do as a public company. Probably a bare minimum, yeah. half a million dollars goes away before you've paid for rent, the copier machine, or salaries. Uh, but the truth is, if you and I form an exploration joint venture, we brought a major in as the funding partner. They might assign us 12% of project expenditures as G&A, with junior mining sector at least represented by a 25 bucket sample, admittedly not a broad enough sample to draw a conclusion, spent 60% on G&A. That makes it an extremely inefficient mechanism to fund exploration. So investors, when they look at the, when they look at the sector, they need to keep those two factors in consideration. They need to limit their speculation on juniors to companies that are of a scale that they spend no more than 25% of capital raised on g and uh, I think that's really, really, really important. When the, when the leader of the company says, we're looking for lithium or part of the new way, I mean, maybe the first question that you ask is looking for lithium. That means you don't have any lithium. Right? And if the price of something that you don't have anything of goes up, it shouldn't matter. But the second question was, are you really looking for lithium? How much money goes in the ground and how much money gets spent on GNA? Uh, so are you looking for investments? Are you looking for funding to operate or are you actually looking for lithium? And, th and that's the 5% of the upside. Hmm. That would be my comment about the juniors. Now, listen, I'm not criticizing the juniors. All of the money that I now invest carefully and prudently, I made speculating wild on the juniors. But I learned a lot of lessons in 45 years. Uh, I learned a lot about what not to do. Uh, not everything that I do do works out, but what I've tried to do is limit my exposure to mistakes by asking intelligent questions. Well, uh, that, that leads us to a nice, uh, a nice point of uh, you're, you do share a lot of knowledge, obviously, with us and with our audience, but uh, with uh, the broader investment community. Uh, you have a show coming up in July. Can you uh, tell us a little bit about that? My favorite question. <laughs> uh, we've now put on uh, a Natural Resources Investment Conference, the Natural Resources Investment Symposium, and for 21 years. The next one is in Boca Raton, Florida. Thankfully, Kitco is a media and executive sponsor. It's in Boca Raton, Florida, July 23rd through 27th. A lot of nice things to say about it. Great big picture. Think it's the Jim Rickards. You know, uh, the Grant Williams, the Nomi Princes of the world. 
uh, wonderful big picture paradigms, but not the kind you'd get on CBC or NBC. Uh, wonderful owls, if you agree with that worldview. Uh, people who've been involved in natural resources for 30 years. Importantly, the living legends. Entrepreneurs, male and female, who have built multi-billion dollar companies from scratch. Who talk about how the lessons that they've learned make them better investors. Importantly, too, every public company exhibitor is owned by the sponsors of the symposium. Uh, in order to be uh, an exhibitor... Uh, we have to know you well enough that we've invested our own time and treasure in those companies. And finally, a 100% money-back guarantee. If you come to the conference live in Boca Raton or if you attend it in your home via live stream and don't believe that you got your money's worth, I personally will refund you 100% of your tuition. The financial risk is all mine. Well, that sounds a lot better than the, uh, than the uh, calculation for juniors, definitely. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time today, Rick. This was great. Thank you for the opportunity. I love talking to the Kitco audience. I've been doing so for two decades now and look forward to doing it again. I'm Ernest Hoffman for Kitco Mining. Stay tuned for more coverage from the Mining Investment Event of the North and don't forget to subscribe. Kitco Mining special coverage of the Mining Investment Event of the North is brought to you by EMX Royalty Corp.